you can now find me on Roadster, the app connecting people through cars. Hello everybody, in today's video I'm going to be talking about the real world side of barn finds. It's rather incredible to believe with skyrocketing car values and the rise of the internet that there are actually any barn finds out there at all. However, it would appear that there are. The truth is that not very many of these are multi-million pound one-off Bugattis or former Le Mans winners left languishing behind a pile of beetroots. The truth is that the vast majority of these are, to me, much more interesting cars. Things that were once very ordinary but now have become rare, become a little bit different. These are the sorts of cars that probably didn't survive past the first decade, let alone the scrappage scheme. But today's video is about the closest thing I think I'll ever come to a genuine barn find, this Z3. Though you may think it does not deserve that title, it actually has many of the same hallmarks. Hard to believe it, but this reasonably late Z3 is now 22 years old. The model as a whole is beginning to disappear from the roads, and though it's still reasonably common, you don't find many with the history that this has. And today I want to talk to you about the reality of taking a car like this, which has been off the road for some time, and what you need to do and spend in order to get it back to a roadworthy state. this isn't how you'd normally picture a barn find, it still possesses many of the same qualities and I went through the same process as if it were a genuine back of the shed type thing that hadn't moved for 20 years. If you're into this kind of stuff, I highly recommend Johnny Smith's Late Break Show, where he seems to have found a near never ending supply of real genuine barn finds and that's content that I find absolutely fascinating. So on to the car then, this is a 2000 BMW Z3, 3 litre. I'll soon be doing a video on the Z3 as a whole, but today is about this specific car. It was purchased in 2000 by a lovely man called Jason. He used it fairly frequently over the first sort of decade, but as the 2010s rolled in, it started to see less and less use. Between 2013 and 2015, it covered less than 2,000 miles, before in 2016 being parked up until 2021. In that time, it covered only six miles between MOTs, so it genuinely didn't go anywhere. And there's a few things that, for me, do make it stand out and a car worth spending a little bit of time and money on. To many people, I'm sure, the Z3 is simply an old, cheap BMW with nothing remarkable about it. But it's exactly that kind of car you need to watch out for, because those are the cars where you simply turn your back for two minutes and they've tripled in price and are now seen as an ultra-desirable classic. Just look at the Subaru Impreza 22B, the old Ford Capri, Escort RS Cosworth, or take your pick of any number of cars that once upon a time littered the streets at bargain prices and are now seriously expensive. This car, I think, has a pretty good chance of being one of the better, more desirable examples out there for several reasons. First off, it's a later car with the three litre engine. More on that in a moment. It also has the admittedly slightly dull, but also very safe color combo of titanium silver over black extended leather. So you've got just a little bit more in the cabin and that does help lift things. The real selling point of this car though is its history because until I took ownership of it last year, it had only one owner from new. The only modifications made to it are these Z8 style wheels that are genuine BMW items, a strut brace at the front and a genuine wind deflector here. That's it. And people do like their fairly original cars. When buying a car like this, there are two things you really need to work out before you've even begun. I call this a barn find, but the fact is, these principles I believe apply to any car you're buying that's been stood for an extended period or has a large chunk of unknown history. First off, what is it that you actually have got? What are you looking at buying? How good is it? What's special about it? Does it come with the history? Anything else? Secondly, and perhaps even more important, 
what is it you actually want to end up with? Do you want to do a full restoration? Do you want a car to come back like it's just come from the showroom? Do you want to modify it? Do you want to change it? Do you want to subtly alter it? Do you want a dramatic transformation? You need to work these things out because if you're buying into a car like this rather than one that's already finished, you're probably thinking of saving some money. But the truth is this, yes, car prices have increased dramatically in the last few years. In theory, this means you've got even more scope than ever to spend and recover your investment. But equally, the prices people are asking for their dusty old bits of tat what have been stuck at the shed since 1997 have also gone up. And in some cases, the prices being asked are just a little bit too optimistic. At the end of the day, if you've got a car that's worth five grand as a shed, and 10 grand as a minter, but it's gonna take you 10 grand to get from A to B, it's just not worth it. The simple fact, of course, is that not everybody buys into a project car to make money from it. For some, it's the simple act of seeing a car restored that brings them more than enough joy. For others, perhaps it's a car that has more sentimental rather than monetary value. Then for everybody else, you've got to work out how much it is that you're willing to spend on the car. Make sure, of course, that what you think it's going to be worth at the end is a realistic sum. And then with just about everything, imagine that there's a lot which is going to go wrong. This, to be fair, is about as easy as it could possibly be. A nice, relatively modern car owned by the same chap from new, kept in decent condition, regularly serviced while it was in use, and then when it was parked up, stored in a nice dry brick garage. This is as good as it gets. This is pretty much beginner level restoration. This car also came with an enormous history folder, which contributes two things. First off, it means that the car will always be worth just a little bit more at the end. Because this is so comprehensive, I'd say it's adding between one to two thousand pounds to the car for the right buyer. It wouldn't be a worse car without that history, but it would be worth a little bit less. As it happens, the paperwork for this car has also solved a rather large problem. When I was getting it, I did an HPI check on it, and it came back all clear by one thing. There was a mileage discrepancy. From one year to the next, the car appeared to do 20,000 miles, and then the following year, it had done 7,000 less. So it went from 27 to 47, back to 40. My initial suspicion, and what the owner told me, was that the MOT station simply made a typo. They put the wrong number in. This happens a lot more than you might think. However, without any supporting documentation, you have only someone's word to go on, and that can be problematic for some. Luckily, I happen to have all the documents from BMW who both serviced and MOT'd it at the time. And cross-referencing all of those things, I was able to confirm, yes, it was simple human error. The car isn't clocked, there isn't anything dodgy about it. I never really suspected that there was, but now I am able to prove it. And that's helpful. The major thing you want to avoid is buying into a car which has some terminal issues. You've got to think that there is nearly always a reason why a car has been parked up for a very long time. Often it's innocuous, sometimes far more sinister. And the truth is, with a lot of genuine barn finds, the person selling the car may have little to no idea about it. And for that reason, I suggest that you try and get it inspected by somebody that knows not just the brand, but if it is something particularly unusual, the model as well. This will help you because your average AA or RAC inspection, while still worthwhile, might not know everything about a specific car. For example, there are lots of cars out there now which once upon a time were fairly common, stuff like say the Alpha Sud, but now many parts are simply no longer available. So what with another car could be a really easy fix might actually be near impossible with something else. If you simply, for logistics or money, cannot get someone to look at the car you're interested in, find said specialist, offer to pay them for their time and spend half an hour or an hour on the phone to them. And in that time, you're likely to glean some very, very valuable information. Firstly, you'll find out about common failure points, issues, and things to look out for. The aforementioned parts availability. They'll tell you what you absolutely must make sure the car comes with. Ferrari toolkits, for example, can be worth five figures now and often do go missing. 
More than that though, you tend to find with a lot of these older cars and stuff much older than this, that there were many different models and trim levels. And sometimes people have a car they believe to be very rare and desirable, but is actually simply a cooking model with some extra parts bolted on. Likewise, you do sometimes still spot stuff that actually is genuinely very rare and unusual, but people just have absolutely no idea. By speaking to a specialist, if you aren't one yourself already, you'll know just a little bit more about whether the car is actually worth buying into, how easy the job might be, and they'll give you some hints and tips on how to make the best decision as to whether it's a car you're happy to take on or not. I also own, although I'll forgive you if you weren't aware because I haven't actually made any videos on it yet, a 1990 Citroen BX GTI 16 valve. And that I think is much closer to how you'd picture a barn find. It was in fact a field find left sat in someone's garden for 15 years. It's actually got a relatively famous past too because it was featured on the TV show Flippin' Bangers. I then bought it from my friend Jack who runs the channel number 27. A couple of the things I just talked about were actually relevant there because on the TV show they said that this was a one owner car. 65,000 miles from you. It's a one owner car. Oh. 65,000 from you. Yeah. Yet it came with some paperwork that they had in their hand on the telly show that proved that it wasn't. This one owner car had been sold to somebody else in 1996. So the one thing they actually said about the car turned out not to be true. Another quirk of those cars is because they have the famous Citroen hydraulic suspension. If you store them outside for a prolonged period, it's not automatically the death of them in the way that it would be for many other cars. First off, they're made mostly of composite rather than metal. But more than that, if you park them in some long grass, provided it and the car is dry at the time, when you turn the car off, it will eventually settle almost to the floor. And what this does is create a little hermetic seal around the edge, meaning that the underside of the car is often fairly well protected. What then goes on them instead is in the door here, where rain gets in and because the thing isn't moving, it doesn't get cleared out. So you'll often find that some of these barn find or field find cars can actually be in better condition than ones that have been used. Strange I know, but also apparently true. So if you're buying a car that hasn't gone anywhere for a while, chances are the MOT on it has probably expired. And if it is a car that in theory is reasonably decent, the first thing I say to do is take it to your MOT station and get it tested. The fact is, it's probably going to fail. For those from abroad, the MOT is an industry standard test that we have here in the United Kingdom. And it's essentially a check of a vehicle's roadworthiness. The idea is that it's all uniform. The fact is in practice, not so much, but a competent MOT tester should check all of the vital safety related aspects of your car and a few other ones as well. So if you've got any major oil leaks, issues with your suspension, brakes, corrosion, all that sort of stuff, an MOT should highlight those. And if you've done your inspection pre-purchase correctly, nothing on it really should be a surprise. In any case, the MOT tester will then give you a list of all of the things that you'll need to sort. You don't actually have to get an MOT done. You can simply tell the tester to do a sort of, well, not a fake one, but just a pre-MOT inspection. They'll charge you a bit of money for that, of course, and then you'll know what it is you need to do. If you're particularly paranoid about having a failure in a car's history, I'm not, that's something worth doing. With the Z3, Jason told me he'll be giving me the car fully serviced and MOT'd, which I thought was very kind of him. He even took it to his BMW main dealer because that's where it's always been and he wanted to preserve that continuity, something I do understand. There is a downside to that, and of course, you're going to be paying a little bit more for the service and the stamp, but in this case, I think it's worth it. They did, unsurprisingly, identify a few things and the car failed its MOT on a cracked front spring. He paid to have all four springs replaced and the two front dampers. He had a few other bits done and got the major Inspection 2 service completed. That really was the bulk of the mechanical work done to this car and the total bill for all of that was around £1,700. If a car is like this, it's been serviced relatively recently, been stored in ideal conditions, and has a timing chain rather than a belt, you shouldn't have any concerns about driving it to get it serviced. I wouldn't wait too long to get that done, but you should be fairly safe. However, if this is a car with an unknown provenance, an unknown last service date, and a timing belt, I would suggest getting it trailered to your service centre. 
The fact is, and people forget this, in the UK, although some cars are now MOT exempt, all cars have a requirement to be roadworthy. Otherwise, they can be taken off the road by force if need be. That I don't think is a concern to many people, but what would be more of an issue were if you were to spend all this money buying your dream car, then because you wanted to save a few hundred pounds on getting it trailered somewhere, you drove it, and that was the moment that the belt chose to snap. It's not unheard of, it certainly does happen, and if it does, I would wager that the damage caused is going to be far, far more than the cost of just getting your car trailered somewhere. As you might imagine, the cost of servicing a car can vary wildly, but if it's been parked up for anything more than a couple of years, I would just make the assumption that everything which is serviceable is going to need doing. On something like this, it'll cost you about five or six hundred pounds. It might be quite a bit less on some other older, cheaper cars, and some of those you can DIY quite easily. I'm not a competent DIYer, and for me, I'd always prefer to pay that little bit extra to get somebody who doesn't know what they're doing to do it, and at the end, you get a stamp in the book that I think will also have some value to the next buyer. Despite having had all that money spent at BMW, the car did still have some issues though, and they weren't just cosmetic. The car had a very pronounced wobble at about 40 mile an hour, and there were a couple of potential causes of this. Firstly, the tyres, which were 17 years old and likely flat spotted from having sat around for so long. Secondly, the wheels were all beginning to peel. This one in particular, the offside front, had a massive section of the paint missing, and that almost certainly was going to create a little bit of an imbalance. The brakes, I thought, were a potential cause for concern, but they seemed to be relatively decent. This car, having been stored in a garage, was in reasonably good condition cosmetically. Rust was absolutely minimal. I said in my first video it didn't have any. It turns out that it did. There was a very, very small patch of corrosion just around where the little release is for the boot. They are known for going there. It was only the tiniest amount, and of course, that I wanted rectified. The good news, though, was that wheel wobble aside, the car actually drove really well. Gearbox was tight, engine felt buttery smooth, and as a BMW 6 should. So I felt comfortable progressing to the next stage, the cosmetics. And if you thought mechanical work could vary wildly in terms of both price and quality, paintwork is that times 10. You could pay anywhere from £800 to £80,000 to respray a car, and the fact is, people probably think I'm joking more about the £800 one than the £80,000 one. Obviously, you're not going to spend anywhere near that amount of money spraying a car like this, and for most people, I would say a full respray of a car, say around the £5,000 mark. Depends, of course, on the colour, the car, how bad it is, whether they need to repair any corrosion, so on and so forth. With this, I didn't want to go the whole hog, and to be honest, I thought that the whole hog was perhaps a bit too much, so I went more for the sort of whole piglet. The front and rear bumpers both had the typical scuffs and scratches and things that nearly every car seems to acquire over its life. The side sills also had a couple of very odd marks on them, possibly from ingress and egress, heels or shoes or umbrellas or something catching on the side. Then we also had a tiny little patch of corrosion around the lock at the back. I figured if we were getting all that done and we already had the flaking paint on the wheels, we should get that tended to as well. And when I was looking at them, I realised that the bolts on the wheels were also past their best, so I decided to replace those with new black ones. I put some spacers on the back, and I decided, as we were going to all of that effort, to then leave on the nasty, slightly crusty-looking brake calipers, though they were working fine, did seem to be uh, just a little bit defeatist. I figured, let's get that done as well while we're in there, and let's change the discs and pads too. Those are both 15 years old at minimum, so it's not really going to hurt to get those done too. I had nearly all of this work done by Suffolk Car and Body Repairs, who I haven't used previously, but will be using again. Uh, none of the prices in this, by the way, that I'm quoting are special YouTuber prices that you'll never be able to get. I didn't really get any discount on anything for this car, barring a little bit of help with logistics and transport and, and stuff like that. The cost of doing all the bodywork was just under £2,000. The most incredible bit is this car arrived with a dent in the absolute worst possible place, here on the rear crease by the wheel arch. That's an awful place to try and repair. There was no damage to the paint, so they got their dent man out who managed to fix it without a drop 
of paint being required. And honestly, they've done an absolutely incredible job. I didn't think that that could be fixed easily at all, but they managed it. At the same time as we did all of that, I also put some new tires on, of course, and we've gone for Falcons here. I quite like them when I had my E46. They seem to be a favored brand of the BMW community. And for a car like this, I think they suit it quite well. Cup 2Rs again here would just be inappropriate. The cost of doing all the brakes was just under £500, and this was facilitated by Suffolk Car Body Repair's neighbours, Landy Part, who were able to get everything in at a decent price and get it fitted too. Just seemed sensible to me. If you're going to be selling a car, you want good tyres and brakes, don't you? I do. Beyond all of that, the only other things I've done to the car are to replace the slightly old gear lever, which fell apart in my hand on the way home from Jason's, and we also fitted new centre caps for all the wheels. There was one other piece of the puzzle that I planned to do, but didn't, and that is the stereo. This car has the old BMW business CD unit, which I think still works. However, the aerial is gone, and I don't really have CDs anymore. This means it's essentially useless. My plan was to refit in here a modern but retro looking head unit that would have DAB radio, Bluetooth and so on, fit a new fancy aerial and also upgrade the speakers. That was gonna cost about 1500 pounds, but everyone I spoke to about this said, no, 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 don't do that. These are really desirable head units. People absolutely love those. So I've opted to not spend the money at present. It's going to go to Provenance Cars, who are gonna be selling it for me, and I've asked them to do what they think is correct, and that will probably depend on the buyer. I'm sure some people won't even care that the stereo doesn't work. Others will want a more modern system like I do, and some might simply be happy with just having their AM and FM working and nothing else. So we're gonna wait and see what the buyer wants to do. You don't need to spend that much money on fixing a stereo, and this is another one of these areas where you can spend a little or you can spend a lot. I would say an absolute minimum, about three to 400 pounds will fix nearly all problems a car stereo has, and you can of course spend a few thousand more if you want really decent sounds, but with barn find type cars, people often don't really care. All in then, the cost of getting this car mechanically and cosmetically back to the condition you would expect of it was around £5,000. The fact is, I think we actually got away fairly lightly with this. The paintwork could easily have been far worse and your cost with that goes up quite dramatically, quite quickly. Just having to do, say, the bonnet or a door, something like that can add a considerable amount to your bill. Likewise, if you wanted to, you could have spent a lot less on this car, but I think this example really was worth spending the extra on. The other thing with doing a project like this is that the price of the car and the price of the work are often unrelated. So it's very easy to have a fairly cheap car that at the end of it will not be worth all that much, which could cost you a heck of a lot to get there. My Citroen BX, for example, I fully expect to make a considerable loss on, but it's such a rare car and I feel a sort of, uh, I think responsibility is maybe too grand a word, but I have this desire to do the right thing for that car. I'm in this lovely position where I can afford to spend on a car and when I sell it, I don't have to get all that money back. So I can take advantage of that and return to the world a car that otherwise may simply have languished in a garage until it got to the point where it also was no longer economical to repair. Luckily, that's not been the case with the Citroen and hasn't been the case with this. There are certain things you'll have to watch out for, in particular if you are buying a genuine barn find. Cosmetic stuff is generally fairly easy to spot, but some cars are quite good at hiding corrosion. Things like TVRs in particular, with their composite bodies, those are excellent at hiding some sometimes fairly serious problems, resulting in a full body-off restoration that will cost you the lower end, but still five figures. Then you've got things like rodents, and they cause all sorts of damage. At a quick inspection, you may not even notice their presence, although some cars have fewer hiding places than others. To give you an example of just how damaging a rodent's presence can be, my friend Damien from the Car Guys had something with a tail do 6,000 pounds worth of damage to his 911 GT3. That's a nearly new car and he keeps them stored in pretty good conditions, about as good as any car can ever expect. And even still, in a fairly short space of time, that did a lot of damage. Something that's been in a barn for 10 to 20 years, I'd nearly say to expect 
to find some sort of droppings in there and something having been munching on your wiring loom. For certain cars, that may not be particularly difficult to fix. For others, it will be. This harks back to what I said at the beginning about working out what it is that you want to do with the car, what path it is you want to take. Do you want to go for total and complete originality? Do you want to go completely modified or do you want to tread a path in between? That is the path I think I would go down, trying to keep a car reasonably original, but where appropriate, making small and sympathetic upgrades. Wiring is one of those areas where on older cars, it may have degraded to the point where to try and fix it is simply gonna cost you far more in both time and money than replacing. And very often, a replacement of the timing or ignition system can give you a car that in practice is much, much better to use and to enjoy. For some cars, any form of deviation from the original is seen as a great disservice and will devalue it. But if you're the sort of person that likes to use your car, and there are always those people out there looking to buy, I think doing things like that to make a car a little bit more reliable, a little bit more durable, a little bit more year-round friendly should always be encouraged. The good thing about a car like this is that they were made in great quantity and relatively recently, which means pretty much anything you need, you can get, and it won't be expensive. People often talk about old Ferrari or Lamborghinis and stuff like that having an issue because parts are pricey. That's actually nearly never the problem. The problem, and I have experienced this, is when the parts are unavailable. Pricey, you can deal with. It's not fun but you can sort it. If you just can't get the thing you need, you are in trouble. Sometimes it's not an issue, and say with an old Ferrari or something, fixing the paint is pretty much exactly the same price as fixing the paint on this. And the mechanical side too, the parts themselves, the normal, ordinary maintenance stuff, oil, spark plug, belts, all those things, they're no more expensive than on pretty much any other car. The difference is in labor, and if you happen to come across something, you can no longer get. And that's where that little added bit of brand specialism can be really, really helpful. Speak to somebody that knows the cars, knows the models in particular, particular and you may find out some very very helpful things or at the very least something fun you can tell all your mates down the pub for now though i hope that's been a reasonably insightful video into what you have to do to sort of recommission a car this is nowhere near what you'd call a restoration i think even the citroen is maybe on the cusp of whether you term that a restoration or a recommissioning the reason if you're wondering you haven't seen anything on that yet is because it broke I knew it needed things anyway, but it's actually developed a fairly serious problem, which I'll try and talk about when I can. I wanna get the car off my driveway to somewhere that I can film, but I need to trust it to get there. And at the moment, I'm not sure if I do, but there will be more on that soon. And if uh, you all enjoyed this video, I am certain you will love that one because that's gonna be a much bigger, much more involved job on something that I think really is a proper classic. This is almost there but worth spending the money on. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.